The citizens of the Empire are a deeply religious and superstitious people. There are a great many spirits and other worldly creatures, but the greatest of these are the gods. There are variations across the Empire and more beyond its borders, but ten gods are recognized as being the most powerful deities that demand offerings and sacrifice. It is the worship of these powers that bind the folk of the Empire together, and today we will examine Shalia. Shalia, the goddess of healing, mercy, and childbirth, is possibly one of the most loved deities in the Old World. Common holy symbols of Shalia include the dove and a heart with a drop of blood. Much like the other cults of the Empire, the cultists of Shalya also employ a variety of hand gestures for a variety of situations. In particular, they use a salute that involves making a crossing symbol over one's heart, typically with their head bowed. Another common sign is the touching of the lips with the first and second fingers, then presenting those fingers towards a person. This is used to show great respect and admiration. Cultists tending to a person in their last moments of life hold one hand to the dying victim's heart while pressing the other hand onto their own as a way of showing sympathy and hope that Shalya shows mercy on their body and spirit. A rare few Shalyans actually slap each other in greeting to reflect their goddess's suffering. Known as slappers, to many they seem ridiculous. Additionally, while priestesses of Shalya also engage in ritual tattoos, brands, and scarification, they tend to hide these from view, or just tend to have far fewer than priests of other faiths. Unlike many other gods, there are no major festivals dedicated to Shalya. Shalya acts whenever there is need, and torment does not respect the calendar, so to speak. As one grows up in the old world, they must go through several rites of passage, and Shalian priests have a large role in such rites. During pregnancy, when a woman first feels the stirring of life inside of her, a celebration is held to honor this fertility. Offerings are made to Raya, but also to Shalia, and a priest or priestess of either of those cults blesses the mother's belly with sacred herbs and waters. And because of the high mortality rate of children in the dangerous and dirty old world, the birth of a new child is considered an auspicious event. Obviously, in such a case, prayers and offerings are given to Shalya in thanks for a safe delivery. It is tradition to bury a shilling or some other high-value coin beneath the doorstep of the house. These coins are then dug up and gifted to the child when it reaches the time of their quickening. It is extremely bad luck to spend one's birth coin, ensuring a life of pain and sorrow, at least according to those superstitious enough to believe such things. Necromancers and chaos cultists prize the birth coins of those children who die before attaining their quickening. Ugh. A birthday is another such event where offerings are given to Shalya for the continued good health and safe passage through the world. Now, while the cult of Shalya is granted much respect, uh, it doesn't actually really have any holy sites, at least not in the Empire, or at least not in the Empire proper. There is a holy place known as the Convent of the Stilled Heart, but it is found deep in the haunted hills within Sylvania. The stories say that any undead approaching the convent are instantly destroyed and that the waters from the convent spring can even cure undeath, returning the victim to genuine life. Furthermore, this spring has a reputation for healing conditions that seem terminal. It is common for many a hopeless and mutated or diseased pilgrim to die on their way to the convent of the stilled heart. Be it either from their own illness or from the undead on the road. The pilgrimage to the temple of Shalia at Koron is one of the most popular pilgrimage routes in the old world. 
Also known as the Road to Corone, many people who travel it are sick or crippled, hoping to be healed by the mercy of Shalia when they reach their destination. The fact that people start out sick contributes to the fact that a very high proportion of the pilgrims die along the way. The pilgrimage officially starts from the Temple of Shalia in Altdorf. A few pilgrims join the route later. But unless they live along the route, most people prefer to go to Altdorf and start with everyone else. In part, this is due to the belief that Shalia is more impressed by people who make the whole pilgrimage. The main motivation, however, is that the temple in Altdorf arranges for groups of pilgrims to travel together and encourages warriors with reason to be grateful to join them. Fairly solid rumors suggest that the temple occasionally pays for such guards if they cannot find those willing to go out of charity. The priestesses in Altdorf record the names of everyone leaving on their pilgrimage and pray for them every day until they return to the temple or until two years have passed. About a third of the pilgrims, particularly those from distant parts of the empire, give up once they reach Altdorf and content themselves with the blessings of the priestesses there. Most pilgrims walk because they cannot afford any other transport. Some have to be carried by friends or dragged in handcarts because they cannot move under their own power. A tiny proportion have enough money to live well during the journey. Others are reduced to begging, most of them before they get out of the empire. Some of the beggars are arrested as vagrants. Others turn to thievery and are carved. While some, we can by lack of food and drink, simply die of their illnesses. Half a dozen temples along the route from Altdorf to Axbite Pass are specifically dedicated to the needs of pilgrims. Three are temples of Shalia, while the other three are temples of Mor. Superstition holds that one is more likely to die when en route to one of the Morian shrines. Shalian pilgrims do not have to pay the tolls in Axe Bite Pass as long as they are carrying no valuables. Smugglers try to take advantage of this by dressing up as a pilgrim, so the toll keepers have been forced to search those claiming to have nothing. Pilgrims with enough money for the journey can generally afford to pay the tolls as well. The inns are a different matter. One, the Well of Mercy, two days walk from the Empire's border, offers free overnight accommodation, albeit in a rough shed, to genuine pilgrims. The shed is, however, within the wall that protects the inn, and the innkeeper is regarded as a model of charity and piety. The other inns demand that the pilgrims pay, just like anyone else. Rich pilgrims occasionally pay for their whole party, but most groups are forced to camp just outside the inn's walls. Some sections have no inns at all. The stretch known as Ludwig's Run is too long for any but the healthiest walkers or those with mounts to manage in a single day, so many are forced to camp in the middle of the mountain pass. Some even survive the night. The Temple of Shalia in the inner mock fort has extensive accommodations for pilgrims, and thanks to generous donations from people healed by Tuoda of the White Hands, a miracle working priest of the last generation, it also provides six meals to every pilgrim. This temple is also the place where citizens of the Empire change from the white robes represented of Shalia in the most places to the yellow robes roamed by her peasant followers in Koron. The priestesses tell them that this is both a legal requirement and a commandment of the goddess. Pilgrims must pay the toll at the gates in Montfort. Those who have made it this far are likely resourceful enough to find some way to get the money, perhaps even legally. The priestesses there flock to pay. The priestesses there flock. The priestesses press their flock to pay for pilgrims' tolls as a form of charity. But a few notable abuses of this system by merchants and couriers have made most residents unwilling to give their money to strangers. The route then runs north through the foothills of the mountain. The going is difficult and almost impassable for carts, but hostels dedicated to Shalia are located every day's travel along the way. These all have wells and provide free lodging for pilgrims. Sir, Chand Sir Troderis a knight of the Grail is known to ride along the route defending pilgrims. 
These hostels ensure Troder Trotus protection are the reason the route runs inside Bretonia rather than going up through the Raceland. Very few pilgrims are lost between Montfort and the Pale Sisters. Only one in twenty who takes the other route emerges from the Wasteland. The hostels continue through the Pale Sisters as far as the temple itself. The kings of Bretonia have traditionally given some support to these hostels, and King Lewin the Unker does so more enthusiastically than most. However, moves to establish them within Axbite Pass or the Empire have all failed due to raids by orcs and bandits. No one has yet been able to prove that the innkeepers on the route are responsible, but there are rumors of just such a conspiracy. Although the hostels make the Bretonian leg of the route relatively easily, still only one pilgrim in ten actually reaches Corona alive. Pilgrims of the Empire who make it are prayed for by the High Priestess in person and a few even receive miraculous cures. The pilgrims must then return home. More than a half of these pilgrims who return from Corone come back healed, a fact publicized by the cult, which encourages others to attempt the journey. A less well-known fact is that fewer than one in a hundred return at all. Jalia is said to be the daughter of Verena and more, tempering both death and justice with mercy. She feels the suffering of every living thing, and as a result, is constantly in tears. Some legends say that her tears can even move her father, and that, as a result, he refuses to see her. He knows the danger inherent in yielding to pleas to return the dead. Other legends say that her father forbade Shalia from helping more than one person in a moment, lest no one die. Of the holy books of Shalia, Two come to mind as the most significant. The Book of Sufferings and the Testament of Pergunda. A quick excerpt of the Testament of Pergunda reveals the following. And I said, Can you tell me the tale of Renald and how he achieved godhood? And the child replied, Yes, the greatest trick. A well-known tale. Renaldans claim that, when mortal, Renald was abandoned a gentle soul who robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. This so enchanted Shalia that she fell in love, ensnared by the romance of Renald's deeds. One night, when distributing supplies to the victims of the Fly Lord, Renald fell dreadfully ill and was approached by Moor. Shalia could not bear the loss of her love, so she stole Renald from her father's grasp in the only way she knew how. She let him drink from her holy chalice and granted him immortality. Renald, now a god, laughed at Shalia's naivety. He admitted to the crying goddess that he had never been sick at all, and that he had manipulated her from the beginning. And I said, So, the tale is true? And the child replied, No, it is false. The greatest trick Renald ever pulled was convincing humanity that he had ever even been one of them. From the Testament of Pergunda, on writing wrongs, the greatest trick. Many old worlders enter a temple of Shalia, or at least are tended to by one of the priestesses, and almost all need the services of the priestesses at some point in their lives. The refusal of the cult to become involved in politics has made it a popular target of charity from wealthy nobles and merchants, and the success of the priestesses in channeling that wealth to the needy is notable. Having little need in the way of money or wealth, Shalian priests commonly spend their coin seeking to purchase the most purest of white robes they can in order to display their faith to those around them. Most temples of Shalia are simply decorated, with money going to the relief of pain. And those temples are everywhere, from the smallest village to the largest city. While priests do have much in common as dedicated servants to their gods, they also have many differences stemming from the differences of their deities and beliefs. Let us examine the daily life of a priest of Shalia. Now, most Shalians beg forgiveness for the hurt they have caused others before sleeping every night. This is almost unquiet, but a few feel the need to scourge themselves before sleeping. 
If this is a fairly light, it is regarded as zealous, but still normal. In the morning, a priestess first prepares a meal for someone else before eating her own breakfast. The meal that she gives away should always be slightly better than the one she eats, and pious shallions would rather go hungry than fail to feed another. Less pious shallions follow the form, but have a hearty mid-morning snack about half an hour after their light breakfast. Day to day, shallions take great care to avoid causing harm to others, particularly physical harm. This includes the very minor harm that would be caused by bumping into someone in the street, which makes most shallions very cautious and proud. If a shallion actually injures someone, she must apologize to and compensate the person she harmed. Formerly, only followers of the Fly Lord are exempt from this, but almost no shallion would apologize to a known follower of any of the ruinous powers. A few refuse to apologize to followers of false gods, in this case meaning any god apart from Shalya in, in their eyes, and even to those who dishonor the goddess with their impiety, in this case meaning any shallion who does not follow her teachings as strictly as the priests themselves. A few shallions refuse to eat meat on the ground so that its production harms animals, and some refuse to eat even vegetable and grains on the ground that its production harms plants, but fruits are acceptable. These positions are regarded, obviously, as extreme. However, the goddess is held to be primarily concerned with humans. There are very few Shalians willing to eat pigeon pie, however. Shalian priests can be rather bossy when they feel people are not taking good enough care of others. On the other hand, they are very stoic about their own complaints. No Shalian ever admits to feeling ill or tired when asked. They like to offer advice to their friends and to most people they meet in the street. They get away with this because most people do not want to insult a Shalian. After all, they might soon need their help themselves, and the Shalian is the, and the, Shalian is the most likely person to be willing to give it. Individual temples of Shalia are exceptionally well organized, with clear responsibilities for all residents, and defined chains of authority. This enables them to respond to crises and to deal with the dozens if not hundreds of supplicants who come every day. The cult as a whole, however, does not have policies or plans of action. Shali is concerned with relieving the individual distresses of the people, not with grand schemes. Shali's primary concern is mercy, the relief of pain. Historically, the cult has focused on two main forms of mercy healing and midwifery, because these are the most common and the most blameless. Everyone is born, and the mother's agony at that time is suffering in a noble cause. Similarly, injury and sickness are rarely the victim's fault. A priestess who concentrates on these problems can easily fill her time with service to the goddess, without offending anybody's sensibilities. However, Shalia is concerned with relieving all pain, even that for which the victim can be blamed. Aid for the poor, whether food distribution, temporary accommodation, or even work in the temple itself, is a common feature of Shalian temples. Some priestesses work with the insane. Others make a point of suffering the lot of those in prison. Rulers tend to have their suspicions of such priestesses, but they argue that the followers of Shalia must soften the blow of both of her parents. The good works of the Shalayans are not unlimited, however. The cult is concerned with relieving suffering, not with providing opportunities for growth and development, or for making an average life better. While few Shalayans would be upset if they made someone happy, that is not their goal. They seek rather to eliminate misery. Thus, Shalayans help those who are actively enduring torment, not those who are simply in need of uh, help to improve their lot in life. Shalayans tend not to think about the big picture. There is no way that they could relieve the agony of everyone in the world, and thinking about those that they could not help nearly makes it hard to go on. Most Shalayans relieve the mercy they see, rather than looking for people who may be suffering more. They focus on solving the immediate problem, not on doing the greatest good for the greatest number. When it comes to beliefs, the core beliefs of all Shalayans is that they should work to relieve the suffering of others. 
Casual adherents give more to charity than most and are more likely to help somebody who has fallen in the street. But for initiates and priests, this calling comes to dominate their whole lives. As far as strictures go, there are six which adherents of Shalya must follow. Number one, avoid killing. All followers of Shalya take this stricture extremely seriously. Number two, never refuse healing to a supplicant genuinely in need. Number three, never halt a soul when it is time for it to depart. Number four, go about your life unarmed. A stout walking stick is all you'll ever need. Number five, abhor the fly lord in all of his forms. And finally, number six, do not waste energy on your own pleasure. There are two main groups within the priesthood, those who provide care directly and those who organize other people to make sure that care is provided. The first group has an almost completely positive image. It is not uncommon for patients to fall in love with their nurses, a condition known as dove fancying. And normally Chileans cite the sacred priest-patient relationship as a reason to do nothing. Many Chileans do, however, find their husbands this way. Old Chileans are often generous with their advice as well as their help, while those of middle years are typically very motherly. The younger ones have a popular mythology of all their own. These young, pretty Chileans are popular characters in ribald jokes and scurrilous chat books. The cult generally tolerates this because the priestess is always portrayed positively, but all Chileans are aware of and quick to spot a certain type of patient. Such men are never turned away, but they find themselves treated by the oldest Chilean available. A few very canny adventurers have noticed this also gets you the most Chilean available, and fake it. The Chileans who organize care have a more ambiguous reputation. Everybody respects them, but a lot of people prefer to stay out of their way, lest they be roped into looking after the sick. Some are happy, bustling types who just sweep people including their children, neighbors, and random passerbys, up into the process of helping the sick and helpless. Others are sterner, with a firm idea of discipline and a general disapproval of people wasting their time enjoying themselves when they should be getting on with work. The young, pretty stern disciplinarian, Shailen, tends to be particularly popular with the Empire's nobility, at any rate. They are often summoned for personal attendance and receive large gifts. A few have even married into the lower ranks. When it comes to being initiated, most priestesses of Shalea are orphans, raised in a temple, and destined for the priesthood almost from birth. Characters who wish to become initiates of Shalia must first demonstrate their continuing devotion to the goddess. A single spectacular act of selfless mercy is almost never enough. Rather, the character must pour much of her energy into helping others over a substantial period of time typically at least a year. Although temple wards spend their childhood at this stage, different temples favor different kinds of service. Initiates of Shalya are expected to spend all of their time working with those in need, and to show at least a, a lack of concern for their own comfort. Those who do so may become priests, and continuing selfless work results in promotion within the temple. Most Chileans spend some time traveling the old world early in their careers, relieving distress as they find it. Almost all temples encourage this, both because it grants a wider understanding of the world and because traveling is generally a hardship and a sacrifice, and thus appropriate to followers of the goddess. Some Chileans also spend time at a temple in a particularly dangerous location. This is as respected as travel. A few priests spend their whole careers traveling, never becoming part of a temple. And while these individuals are revered, this is not considered normal. Service to Shalia is one that demands selfless devotion, and the initiation rites used in most temples both test and exhibit this quality. The details vary a great deal, but a version of the following rite is used in many temples in Nordland during initiation. The postulant, barefoot and wearing a single light robe, stands in the courtyard of the temple for one day and two nights, eating nothing, not sleeping, and drinking only a little water. 
during that time. She may not speak and must help anyone passing through the courtyard that seems to be in difficulties. However, she herself must not leave the courtyard. When day breaks after the second night, a priestess comes with a heavy robe, wraps her up, and leads her to the main altar, where she receives a single meal as from the goddess. At this point, she is a full priestess. Postulants who fail to complete the vigil are allowed to try again later. Shalia is, after all, the goddess of mercy. As far as the cultists themselves, the initiates of Shalia normally wear a simple, long, white robe, a style copied by the more devout lay member. The materials are normally hard-wearing and safe to wash by boiling, as the robes of Shalia devotees often become spattered with deeply unpleasant substances. This means that they are often quite expensive. Good craftsmanship. Good craftsmanship for the role players out there. It's a good quality clothing. You just steal it off, you sell it. That's, that's you know, that's like one-tenth of a cart. Priests wear white robes, often with a hood, with a heart embroidered over the left breast. On daily robes, this is embroidered in yellow. But most priests also have ceremonial robes, made of expensive fabric, and with the little heart embroidered in gold. Best quality, that's best quality, you gotta steal that, that's the one to steal, that, that, that's like, that's like half of a cart. Otherwise, Chileans wear little in the way of ornamentation. There are some regional variations, the most notable are in Bretonia, where sumptuary laws mean that lay members and initiates cannot wear right, and so they wear yellow instead. Even noble lay members wear yellow, as a sign of humility. As foreign pilgrims are not, strictly speaking, peasants, they are not bound by the laws. But due to the erratic awareness of this fact on the part of the nobility, most pilgrims wear yellow until they get to the temple, where they can change into white. All priests of Shalea in that country have an exemption allowing them to wear their vestments, but no other white cloth. Priests of Shalia sell most valuable gifts to raise money for those in need, but do not sell gifts or vestments. Thus, some priests have extremely expensive vestments, gifts from the grateful or generous. Even such expensive gifts must be simple in appearance, or else they do not count as vestments. The standards for this, though, vary from one temple to another. The cult of Shalia has a nominally feudal structure, with each shrine or temple owing tribute to a larger local temple and these large temples owing tribute to the chief temple of the nation. All national temples owe fealty to the temple in Coron, and the chief priests and priestesses meet once every six years at the governing body of the cult. The seat of power for the cult of Shalia lies in Coron, deep within Bretonia. The head of the cult is the most holy matriarch Lisengund, the high priestess of Coron. However, in the Empire, worshippers look to High Priestess Anya Gustafsson, who is the High Priestess of Altdorf. The Matriarch in Coron has authority over all Shalians. In particular, the authority to cast them out of the faith. This power is only used when a follower turns to the Dark Gods, as mercy is appropriate for anyone else. Below the Matriarch, the chains of tribute are largely nominal, and do not carry much sense of power. Nevertheless, a number of temples do have particularly good reputations, and since the most promising priests spend time there, this is self-perpetuating. This temple in Altdorf is a good example of this. The high priestess there is traditionally chosen by the high priests of all Chilean temples in the Empire, and she has a great deal of moral authority. Altdorf is also regarded as a very testing position for initiates or priests with potential. There are many who need their help, but so many temptations to do otherwise. Chileans on a whole are uncomfortable with wealth or valuable treasures, but their unstinting help to all means they receive many gifts. Most of these are used to help others, or sold to that end, but not all. The priests feel they cannot sell holy images of Shalia or similar sacred goods. By tradition, then, such wealth is passed up the organizational hierarchy to the temple to which the receiving temple owes tribute. If that temple is in an urban area, it keeps most of the goods, passing the finest onto the chief temple of the nation. The wealth of the, on display in these places often shocks visitors who assume that they are corrupt, at least compared to their austere rural shrines. 
As a result, the clergy of those temples have a strong tendency to asceticism. Individual temples are strictly organized with the high priestesses in absolute but merciful control. All temples and shrines, no matter how small, try to serve all needs, but most specialize to some extent. In larger temples, the different functions are administratively separate with their own heads reporting to the high priest and their own staff. The hospital is probably the most characteristic function, treating both injuries and disease. Areas for childbirth are also kept separate from, but close to, the hospital, as complications in childbirth often require medical attention. Madhouses are only found in temples large enough to have a separate area, or in shrines that specialize in confining and caring for the insane. Many Chilean temples have an orphanage, raising children, mainly girls, to be servants of the cold. Even among the temple wards, not all show the necessary aptitude for serving the weeping maiden, and some of these are married off to wealthy merchants in return for substantial donations. Chilean orphans have a reputation for being very obedient, solicitous wives, and devoted mothers. Temples may also provide doles of food and occasionally clothing to the poor. Very few do this at the temple itself. The poor with the energy to come to the temple are not the ones the most in need of food. Instead, initiates and low-ranking priests are sent out to deliver bread. The priests look favorably on large, intimidating warriors who go along to help carry the food. There are no formal sects within the Order of the Bleeding Heart and no outright disagreements on doctrine. Different followers do place differing emphases on the various aspects of the Chilean faith, and this does give rise to vigorous disputes within the temples. However, these disputes are generally private. The cult presents a remarkably united front. As far as asceticism goes, the approach is perhaps the locus of most variation in the cult. This revolves around the question of how far you should go in serving the goddess. First, is it wrong for Chilean to enjoy the things that come to her with no effort? If a noble offers her a glass of fine wine, is it wrong to accept? Should she sit in a comfortable chair if she is offered one? Most Chileans think this is obviously acceptable. It does not interfere with the work, and they cannot use the offered luxuries to help the poor. A radical minority of Chileans believe it is wrong for Chilean to enjoy her work. She should serve the suffering out of duty, not because she gets satisfaction from helping people. A slightly smaller minority believe it is wrong for anyone to enjoy themselves. There should be no happiness in a world so full of misery. While a minority, this group is not tiny, and its members seem to be attracted to running the temple orphanages. The more general debate sees more disagreements, and these disagreements do not fall easily into defined camps. Priests pick and mix from among the possible answers. The fundamental question is how much of a priest's time and resources should go on serving the goddess. Radicals insist that a priest should spend every waking moment in a hospital or tending to the sick elsewhere, and should minimize the amount of time she spends asleep. Most Chileans accept that it is bad policy to try to work all the time, as it leads to mistakes. Most accept that quiet prayer is an acceptable break, and a substantial minority believe that any refined pleasure, those not involving violence or large quantities of alcohol, is permissible. A Few think that anything that does not harm others or impede a Shalian's work is fine for relaxation. Of course, a lot of Shalians do overindulge in alcohol, or at least in part to blot out the horrors they have seen. Haha! <laughs> but hardly anyone in the cold thinks that such behavior is right. Shalians with a family face deeper dilemmas. Shalian orthodoxy is that Shalian parents should not privilege their children in any way. Those who hold to this place their children in the temple orphanages, to be raised as any other foundling. Most Chileans with children bend orthodoxy, but they have a reputation for being far less indulgent to the children than to just about anyone else. When a Chalian angers her god, typically they look to acts of simple penance, the most common being prayer and fasting. The Shalians see fasting as showing sympathy for the starving. However, when it comes to harsh punishment for a severe infraction like many of the other cults dole out on their delinquent priests, 
The Shaoyans do not believe in punishment. Instead, they give the offender the opportunity to work their way to reconciliation through chores throughout the temple. Those who refuse such a mercy are usually handed over to the other cults. To break up the pace of this video, let's look at some common sayings revolving around Shalia. One could say, she has Shalia's eyes, meaning that she only sees the pain and suffering in life, that she is a pessimist. She has Shalia's hands. She's a very kind person, is what that saying means. According to Adelie's Bergenkampf, an outlaw chief, don't cross the Shalians. Sure, she won't hurt you. She's the bleeding heart. But you don't want her parents mad at you. I think his leg's broken. Quick, get a Shalian, says Ulrichs Lieb Martinson, a Middenheim laborer. As I ate your bread as a child, may you eat my bread now, says Dietrich Ragnar, merchant of Marienburg, giving a cart of bread to the Temple of Shalia that fed him when he was a poor child. Every day, just as the market opens, so that everyone can see and hear. You do not steal from the Temple of Shalia, says a Talibheim thief, explaining professional ethics to a colleague. They're just sneaky, manipulative politicians who steal business from honest folk. Someone should expose them for the frauds they are, says Master Augustus Limmerstein, an Altdorf doctor. Another debate is over the extent to which Shalian should choose who to help. A significant minority argue that they should not choose at all, simply helping anyone who comes before them in pain. They believe the goddess herself guides them to the right people. Most Shalians, although not much more than half, believe it is acceptable to spend a short period of time assessing the needs of the people before you before deciding whom to help first. A fairly small minority believe that they should spend some time finding the people to help, help them, and then move on to another group. No Shalian, even in the last group, would ignore an injured person if he was the only person in sight, however. A tiny minority of Shalians believe they should try to change the structure of society. This group is close to being heretical since most Shalians think they waste too much time that could be spent helping people. However, all Shalians agree that the Fly Lord is the foulest blot of them all, and they would rejoice were it to be destroyed. Opinions over what to do about servants of the Dark God vary, however. A small minority believe that even they deserve mercy, arguing they suffer at least as much as their victims. An equally small minority believe in seeking out and destroying such cults. These followers drift into more martial cults, particularly that of Myrmidia. The mainstream debates the balance between simply treating the victims of the plague and trying to stop them at the source. Many Shalians believe in just treating victims until the plague god visits their area. Then they believe the plague should be stopped at the source, but they are far too busy treating victims to act to that end at that point. The most prominent holy order of Shalia is the Order of the Bleeding Heart. Although it is not the only holy order in the cult of Shalia, the Order of the Bleeding Heart comprises almost all of the priests, temples, and hospices of Shalia. Its members are usually recruited from the orphanages or from children whose mothers have died in childbirth or some other tragedy. Although modern medicine's popularity has grown in leaps and bounds through the last few centuries, it is still very much the newcomer to the village. Every town in the empire has a shrine or temple to the healing goddess Shalia, and the Order of the Bleeding Heart remains a trusted source of care. Emperor Karl Franz himself prefers the healing hands of the Shalian High Priestess, despite his patronage of the Physicians Guild. The order places emphasis on care, food, and housing first, and medicine second. Their reliance on divine powers mean that the mortal members themselves need not focus on perfecting their own skill or knowledge, which can, of course, lead to misdiagnosis. 
Rare are the members of the order with an exceptional healing art, and the art of surgery is almost entirely unknown within its ranks. Not to mention frowned upon. Some Shalian priests have been so often called to deal with the mistakes of botched surgeries that they consider the whole practice to be akin to butchery. Not every temple has an anointed priest in attendance, however, meaning that the higher level magic required to treat the diseased, the pestilence stricken, and the insane is largely unavailable. Such ailments must therefore be left to doctors. Their effectiveness in treating the small plagues that arose in the aftermath of the Storm of Chaos has greatly improved their reputation. However, doctors do not offer hospitals or continued care. Most work out of a single consulting room, and only the richest patients can really afford regular home visits for chronic conditions. The elderly, the wasting, the incurable, and the infirm are only find help from the bleeding heart. Indeed, doctors often prescribe attendance for a week, month, or year at a well-adored Temple of Shalia, enjoying its mineral spas and restorative beverages. That sounds... Pretty nice, if you don't mind me saying. The cult of Shalia has no formal lesser orders, just as it has no formal sex. However, the natural tendency to specialize means that there are a number of recognized groups within the cult. The most notable are the healers and the midwives. But these groups are too large to have much of a sense of collective identity. They just feel like typical Shalians, even to themselves. The priestesses who treat the insane do feel a sense of kinship and eagerly take advantage of chances to meet with and talk with someone who, while sane, understands life with lunatics. However, such chances are far and few between. God, can I relate to that? Having worked three years at a mental hospital. The wandering priests, however, have the opportunity to meet and share a common lifestyle that sets them apart from the main body of the cult. In recent years, some of these priests have even started talking about asking the matriarch to recognize them as a formal order of the cult. The main reason this has not gone beyond talking is that few wandering priests see that it would make any difference. When it comes to divergent views on interpreting the guidelines of Shalia, the cult is actually rather accepting and understanding. The cult spawns very few dangerous factions, as it is difficult to cause harm when one's overarching cause is to further love, compassion, and the healing of the sick and the injured. The most egregious act possible within the cult is for a member to refuse to provide aid to someone in need, particularly when there's little to no reason not to do so. While all cultists receive token donations for the upkeep of their temples, and as a way to feed and clothe themselves, cultists that go into business with their skills are deemed as straying from the true path of Shalia by the rest of the cult. In extreme cases, violators may be imprisoned, but are more likely to simply be cast out of the order. Like any other religious cult, the cult of Shalia attracts extremism, but primarily those extremists are drawn to two sects the Plague Wardens, and the Suffering Hearts. The Plague Wardens believe the central duty of a Shalian is to protect as many people as possible from the plagues and pestilences pervading the Old World. But rather than treating the victims, they aim to stop the plague from spreading and creating victims in the first place. Their goal is noble, but it is their methods that make them fanatics. The only way to stop a plague is destroying the source of its infection. That may mean killing someone with the plague, and then burning the body and boiling the ashes. It also might mean raising a whole section of a town, burning it down while trapping the doomed inhabitants inside. Plague wardens recognize these acts as unpleasant, but they feel they are justified by the greater good. As plague wardens kill people, it goes without saying that they are considered dangerous, and worse, by most members of Shalia's cult. Shalian priestesses who join the cult almost always have trouble casting their spells due to repeatedly breaking the most central tenet of their faith, do not murder. Plague wardens see this as a test imposed by their goddess to ensure that their faith is strong. While plague wardens are violent zealots, 
they do believe they are acting to save people's lives. Thus, they do not kill on mere suspicion of infection, and all groups of Plague Wardens include at least one person with diagnostic abilities. These abilities are not always very good, but Plague Wardens only kill when they are fairly sure Plague is present. They are also among the most implacable of adversaries of the Fly Lord, and if they uncover evidence of a group of his cultists, they ignore all their other plans to concentrate on eliminating the greater threat. Ironically, it is quite likely that the Plague Wardens actually have saved thousands more lives than they have ended. While their membership is very secret, their existence is well known to the educated, and they are a favorite example when priests of Verena discuss ethical dilemmas. Now, it's no surprise that Shalian doctrine is suspicious of personal pleasure in a world with so much suffering, but it is the suffering hearts that take this suspicion to an extreme. They are followers of Karine the Pure, a priestess who lived in Nuln a little over two centuries ago and believed priestesses of Shalia had to purify themselves of the taint of pleasure and luxury before they could properly minister to the suffering. Attempting to do so while impure was, she claimed, blasphemous. While Karine was eventually cast out by the cult for denouncing their entire hierarchy as blasphemous against Shalia, her followers remain in mainstream temples and keep their places by moderating their strictures against others. This also gives them more time to inflict suffering on themselves. Minimal food, little sleep, and a new adi and inadequate protection from the elements are the basic components of the life of a suffering heart. Most believe deliberately infecting injuries on oneself is an affront to Shalya, so instead they take on hard and dangerous tasks, such as carrying heavy stones up to the top of the temple buildings and then back down again. The suffering of hearts do nothing to relieve the pain of others because they follow Kareen's belief that it would be blasphemous to do so before they have been purified. Some suffering hearts do see visions that they take to be signs from the goddess that they have been purified, and these individuals start to help. The proportion of miracle workers among them, while not high, is higher than among other priestesses. Others, however, never feel pure enough, and as a result, the cult hierarchy tries to discourage these beliefs. The goddess of mercy, however, cannot condone harsh measures against people who are merely misguided followers. The Suffering Hearts are not an official sect, as they have no internal organization and their interpretation of Kareen's beliefs can vary a great deal. Indeed, this sort of belief has been present in the Shalian faith for centuries, and Kareen's particular version has little sway outside the Empire. And if you'll recall, the seat is in Caron in Bretonia, so take that as you will. We can take a look at a heretical and outright deviant organization of the cult of Shalia, and that would be the Order of Lancers. Now, not much is known about this mysterious order, but it is spoken in hushed whispers and with great fear. As the stories go, the Order of Lancers were Shalian heretics who performed cures even on healthy individuals. The Shalayan temples are built around a courtyard with the main temple hall on one side, chapels on the other, and the infirmary at one end. In some cases, the other end of the courtyard is closed by accommodation. In some cases, the other end of the courtyard is closed by accommodation for the priests Large temples may have multiple courtyards, in which case the main temple hall is as close to the center as possible. Shalians prefer white stones, and the interiors are normally decorated in white and gold, or yellow. Stone is an expensive building materials, but most Shalians avoid wood, enabling the structure to survive a fire and be able to provide succor in its aftermath. A fountain in the courtyard representing the tears of Shalia is the only common decoration. In some temples, the fountains actually take the form of white marble maiden, with water springing from her eyes. When it comes to major personalities of the cult of Shalia, we can look only to two 
people. The first, Matriarch Lizengun. The Matriarch is highly respected for her personal work, relieving the poor, and healing those afflicted by diseases causing weeping swords. Indeed, she spends so much time working with the sick that she has almost no time to administer the cult. Fortunately, this is not a major problem, as most temples tend to run themselves perfectly well. The second person in question is Sieglind Thorison. Sigling is a wandering priestess active mostly within the Empire, although she has spent some time in the Border Princes and has made a pilgrimage to Corone. She is renowned for her courage and for surviving situations that should have been the death of her. She believes the goddess guides her to the people who need her the most, so she always stops to aid those in need. She is also part of the small group who believe that it is acceptable to take advantage of the luxuries offered to you on the spot. She is so well respected that she can even defend the position in public without anyone casting aspersions on her personal piety. Now, in the old world, there are some people in the empire who are so devout to their cult that they are treated almost as demigods by many of the people of the old world. Although they go by many other titles, the most common moniker attached to these esteemed individuals is Venerated Soul. And the cult of Shalia is no stranger to having venerated souls among them. In particular, we examine the case of Gisela Sauer. According to local legend, there was a healer at the small town of Ferlangen in the province of Oslin. A devout follower of Shalia, Gisela Sauer gave her life to easing the suffering of the afflicted, injured, and dying. In those days, there was so much suffering to go around, since the world lay under the pall cast by the Black Plague, and the dead filled the streets. So many were the corpses that the living were outnumbered, and it was simply easier to burn the dead in their homes rather than to brave the dangerous vapors. Unfortunately, the fires claimed as many dying as they did dead, and some whispered that the living and healthy were also killed by the cleansing fires. What made Gazella stand out from the other selfless clerks was her willingness to treat the sick directly. She helped many victims venturing into the worst hit neighborhoods, even though the risk to her own life was great. Her treatments were unusual and met with mixed success. Though remembered for her work lancing buboes with her sharp pins, she also experimented by rubbing rats against the affected victims, feeding them lye to cleanse their insides, and other bizarre treatments. The healer never realized that despite her self-sacrifice and good intentions, she was actually spreading the disease. She was part of a small sect of Shalians who believed it was wrong to remove one's clothes, since the attire ensured that the contagion could never come in contact with naked flesh. Since she wore the same garbs, she never knew that her own body was covered in boils, weeping wounds, and corruption. Each time she pierced the victim's flesh with one of her needles, she infected him with any number of ailments. The locals had no idea, and if someone told them, they would have refused to believe it anyway. And so Gazella worked as the town died around her. It wasn't until a witch hunter of Sigmar passed through the village and sensed something wrong in the kindly priestess that the truth was revealed. He clapped her in manacles and imprisoned her while his interrogators inspected her body for signs of corruption. To the Templar's surprise, the woman was profoundly ill. To save the town, he had her burned at the stake rather than let the plague spread. Unfortunately for him, he never related the findings to the people, and they, in their despair and outrage over the healer's execution, pulled the man from his saddle and tore him limb from limb. A few months later, when the plague ran its course, an educated noble happened upon the witch hunter's journal and discovered the truth. When word spread of what he had found, the townspeople refused to believe that the woman was actually the cause of the suffering, and suggested that it was her sacrifice to the purifying fires that saved them. To commemorate this, they petitioned the cult of Shalia to name her a venerated soul, claiming that her death spared the town. A true miracle. The nobles argued against this, but they were silenced. Since there were no other voices of dissent, the cult of Shalia named the temple and the community after her, and installed a small shrine near the door. Gazella's most ardent followers have left a number of long needles so that they can prick themselves to invoke the blessing of their venerated soul. A rather 
humorous official adventure hook titled Lust in the Heart revolves around a priest of Moor and a high priestess of Shalia. The priest of Moor decides that his goddess told him in a dream that the high priestess of Shalia is turning her temple into a brothel, attracting donations by offering the favors of the priestesses. While a lot of the citizens of the town would love for that to be true, the high priestess swears that there's nothing to it, and that the priest of Moor is just upset because she rebuffed his advances. She wants the player characters to stop the campaign against her so that the temple can get on with healing the sick. One last thing to tie this all up, the question of Shalian priests. Now, the overwhelming majority of Shalian priests are actually priestesses. Most old worlders would be reluctant to believe a man could actually be a priest of the goddess. Nevertheless, the goddess does accept men. They are relatively well represented among the wandering priests, in fact. Young male priests of Shalia almost always wander, as the heads of temples are generally reluctant to put handsome young men into environments where they are greatly outnumbered by impressionable young women. The wanderers are encouraged to stay for a while and then move on, without breaking any hearts. Cult legends tell of priests who exploited their appeal to the priestesses and were devoured by Slanesha's punishment. Unauthorized versions of these legends are quite explicit about the details of both the exploitation and the devouring, and are popular forbidden books. Vor is popular in the old world. Who would have who would have guessed? I regret doing this video now. As priests become old and unattractive, they, they do take up residence in a temple. Alright, that's it. That's gonna that's gonna do it for us for today. This video was kind of a special order for a fan. Uh, next one up will be Back to Magic. And keep an eye out for some other radical videos I've got cooking up. Have a wonderful day. Take care of yourself. Have a beautiful time. And don't kill yourself. Bye!